Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk, The Doctor Will See You Now, Machine Learning for Telehealth. Um, as Teja said, my name is Mark Brausch, and I'm visiting you today from Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, I'm a software engineer at a company called Doximity, and uh, remote's not working, but that's okay. I'll use the arrows. Uh, here are just a few of my amazing colleagues. We build social networking and communication software for doctors and have over 80% of all U.S. physicians as members. Today I'm really excited to talk to you about one way that we leveraged modern browser technology to make our doctors' lives just a little bit easier. But first, I want you all to remember the time right at the beginning of the pandemic. Within a matter of weeks, the entire world went on lockdown. We were urged to stay home, keep our distance, and try really hard not to touch our faces. But doctors got busy, really busy. And to complicate things even further, it became difficult or even unsafe at times for doctors to see patients as frequently as they used to. So to help out, we created a new product called Doximity Dialer Video. We built Dialer Video as an easy to use telehealth experience, different from other video chat apps and services in that it doesn't require any downloads or accounts for patients to use, and it's fully HIPAA compliant, meaning that it follows all patient privacy laws in the US. By not requiring patient accounts or apps to download, this means that even patients with the least amount of technical proficiency are able to easily see their doctor without the complexity of downloading apps, signing up for an account, or remembering their login credentials. We were able to build Dialer Video this way by creating it in the browser using JavaScript and modern web APIs so that the doctor only needs to text the patient a link and the patient is then able to join the call via their web browser right away. We launched the new Dialer Video telehealth experience in April of 2020 for free to all doctors on Doximity. And in the US, that's over 80% of all physicians who are on Doximity and have access to Dialer Video. And since we launched Dialer Video in 2020, there have been hundreds of thousands of clinicians who have used it. And those clinicians have made millions of calls with patients on Dialer Video. All of this is just to say that Dialer Video has had a tremendous impact on telehealth in the United States uh, since it was launched at the beginning of the pandemic. And as the pandemic worsened, things started to get a little scary. In many places, hospitals restricted or even prohibited visitors out of concern for safety. And so we began to see another use for dialer video beyond just doctor to patient communication. Dialer in some instances became a quick and easy way for doctors to connect families together when people were hospitalized in isolation. As Dr. Sean Hamm tweeted in August of 2020, my COVID positive patient was transferred to the ICU today. He wasn't able to see his wife tonight due to the visitor policy, so I walked myself up to the ICU and used Doximity on my phone so they could say, I love you tonight in person. Yeah. And while all of this was going on, a lot of us were working from home. In fact, let me see a show of hands. First, before the pandemic started, how many of you were already working from home? Just a couple, yeah. I was also, yeah. And uh, how about during the pandemic then? Who was working from home? Yeah, just about everybody, right? Well, let me let you in on a little secret about doctors. They're regular people too. And aside from the advanced medical degrees and years of training and the literal ability to save lives, they're just like you and me. And during the pandemic, that meant that even doctors had the ability or even the necessity sometimes to work from home. Of course, sometimes the home does not make the best office, particularly for those who are suddenly thrust into the work from home life. And it can be a real challenge to maintain an air professionalism when working from home sometimes. This is like my favorite Jeff of all time. I love this. For doctors in particular, though, it can be really important to appear professional on video calls, especially telehealth calls with patients. So to address this need, we built a feature for Dialer Video called Virtual Backgrounds. 
Many patients, especially children, feel some level of anxiety when talking with their doctor, and having a consistent, professional-looking background can help to reassure patients that they're in good hands. This ability to choose a background also helps busy doctors, who might bounce between the home and several different hospitals and offices, to always appear in the same place when talking to their patients. Dr. Simone Tomasi, a psychiatrist, perhaps put it best when she cited virtual backgrounds in Dialer Video as being a luxury that allows her to maintain a professional setting wherever she is, and that offering a familiar, reassuring space is crucial for her patients. So today, I'm going to show you how we built this virtual backgrounds feature in the browser using JavaScript. But first, let's talk a little bit about what a virtual background actually is. Anyone who has seen a Marvel movie before probably knows that a lot of it is filmed in front of a green screen and that the background is added later virtually. I think I saw somebody at lunch wearing a Marvel shirt, so sorry, but Wakanda is not real. However, my favorite example of background replacement using a green screen comes from watching the TV meteorologist give the weather forecast. And here you can see the legendary Chicago meteorologist Tom Skilling show the exact reason why I left the Midwest and moved to Hawaii. <laughs> the way this works for Tom and for all TV meteorologists is that every morning they stand in front of a big green screen and they point at an imaginary weather map. As they do this, a video mixer causes anything that is green to become transparent, and then the weather map image is layered behind in a technique known as chroma key compositing. Chroma keying is very effective and has worked this way for a long time, even in the days of analog video. The only problem with this green screen method of background replacement, however, is that you need a green screen. Now, this is something that you might find in a television or a movie studio, but probably not at home. So how then can we replicate this effect without the use of a green screen or a physical prop or other piece of equipment? Well, the answer is quite simple. Magic. <laughs> Just kidding, we're going to use machine learning to do this. Yeah. Specifically, we're going to leverage two machine learning projects, TensorFlow and MediaPipe. These two projects both accomplish similar tasks, but in slightly different ways and we're going to use them together to build our virtual background feature. TensorFlow is a complete machine learning library. It is offered in several programming languages and can be used for the full spectrum of machine learning tasks, from training models to implementing a client-side machine learning runtime, which is what we'll be using it for. Here are some of the pre-trained models available to use in TensorFlow's runtime. They range from image classification and object detection to text and speech recognition. MediaPipe also works as a machine learning runtime, and it has a special focus on image recognition and manipulation. To build our virtual background feature, we're going to employ a machine learning technique known as image segmentation. Image segmentation represents the way of training a computer to recognize which parts of an image belong to certain entities. For example, Using the deep lab model, as shown here, we can input the image of a child riding a bicycle and receive an image where the bicycle is painted green and the child pink. The way these models are trained and interpreted is a very interesting topic, but unfortunately outside the scope of this talk. At a high level, however, image segmentation works by analyzing an input image and then assigning a certainty value to each pixel of whether it belongs to a given entity. In other words, we can process an image through a machine learning runtime and receive which parts of the image are believed to be part of a person and which parts are just the background. Therefore, our virtual background feature will resemble something like this. For every frame of video, we will process the frame through our machine learning runtime using a pre-trained model that segments people. Next, we'll take that segmented image and use it as a mask on our original frame. And then finally, we'll paint in our chosen virtual background and output the composited frame. To pull this off at a steady 30 frames per second, we'll have approximately 33 milliseconds to perform this entire cycle for every frame. That means we're going to need a very fast model 
in order to run in a web browser on a standard computer in real time. Luckily, MediaPipe provides the perfect pre-trained model for us to use called selfie segmentation. This model was trained specifically on source images shot from the chest up at about the distance that a person would sit from their webcam. This allows it to perform relatively quickly for a limited category of images, but ones which we'll typically find in a video chat application anyway. We know how this model works and performs without first needing to test it out ourselves, thanks to a concept called model cards. Model cards were introduced as a way of succinctly summarizing how a model was trained and functions. It includes such information as the model's intended uses and limitations, ethical considerations about the model, like if it can be used to identify individuals, how the model was trained, including information about the source data that was used, and how accurate the model performs and how that accuracy is measured. For the selfie segmentation model that we'll be using, we can see on the model card that its intended use is to segment a person in an image taken from a webcam, that it was trained on a diverse set of source images, including people from all demographics, and that it performs fairly across a variety of people. You can see from this model card, and sorry for those in the back, um, there will be a link to this model card and other resources at the end of the presentation, but you can see from this model card that the selfie segmentation landscape model varies in accuracy only 1.15% between different skin tones and only 0.6% between different genders. This performance is a very important consideration to have when using in an application with a diverse set of users like ours does. Okay, so now that we have chosen our model, we can begin to see, or rather how the computer will see, how to create a mask for our virtual background. This is, in essence, computer vision. However, simply segmenting an image doesn't give us a finished virtual background effect. To finish the feature, we'll need to implement an image manipulation technique known as compositing. Compositing, put simply, is a method by which multiple images are combined to create a single composited image. For our virtual background feature, this means we'll be compositing the foreground, a person, and the background, our chosen virtual background. To do this, we're going to use JavaScript and the browser's Canvas API. Compositing a virtual background can be done in four steps. First, we'll paint our segmentation mask that we received from the machine learning runtime. Next, we'll apply a bilateral filter to smooth out the mask. A bilateral filter is an image processor that reduces noise in a given image. You might be familiar with a type of bilateral filter used in many video chat applications that smooths out skin and makes you look a little bit younger. You can see here that the original mask can include a bit of noise, particularly around the edges. By applying a bilateral filter to the mask, we can greatly reduce the amount of edge noise, thereby increasing the quality of the final composite. Once the bilateral filter has smoothed out the segmentation mask, we'll paint the source image on over the mask, leaving us with just the foreground composite. And then finally, we'll paint our virtual background in behind the foreground leaving us with the final composite image. Now, before we jump into some code, let's take a quick look at a demo application. The demo app is a Twilio video application running on Vue and Nuxt that captures webcam input and applies a virtual background effect to it. Twilio video is by no means required to build a virtual background feature, but we're going to use it for the demo to show how you might build this feature in a real WebRTC video chat context. Shout out to Twilio for making an amazing video chat SDK. There will be a link at the end of this demo and at the end of the presentation where uh, you can play around with it and view the full source code, but be warned that the demo only works in browsers that support the off-screen Canvas API, so you'll want to try this out on your desktop Chrome browser for now. I'll explain why this limitation exists in just a bit, but for now, let's jump in and see the demo in action. All right, okay. One minute. Just gotta connect here.
Uh oh. Um, let's see. I think I have it also running locally here somewhere. Yeah, here's what we can do. All right, there we go. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Wouldn't be a conference presentation without a little bit of technical difficulty during the demo section, right? So, okay. So, what are we looking at here? Um, well, you can see on the uh, left side um, that's the source image coming from my webcam, and then on the right side, this is the final composited um, virtual background, and it's running in real time. Um, this is coming from the webcam. Um, I'm standing right in front of the camera, so it's, it's pretty crisp around the edges. And then what we can do is we can actually uh, take a look at the individual composite steps down below. And this illustrates how the compositing works along each step. So in the bottom left, we have the raw segmentation mask that comes from our machine learning runtime. And uh, it might be hard to see from, from out there, but it can be a little bit rough around the edge. So in the middle step, we apply our bilateral filter and uh, that will take care of some of the noise around the edges. And then finally, in the bottom right corner, you can see the final composited foreground. All right, so that's the demo, and I will show now um, how, how the, the code for, for making that works. Switch back here. Okay, great. So to build the app, we're going to need to connect several modules. I'm going to focus on just a few of the important parts for the sake of time. We'll start with an HTML video element that contains our virtual background. This doesn't actually have to be rendered to the DOM. Next, we need a function called createSegmenter that will initialize our machine learning runtime, connecting TensorFlow with our MediaPipe selfie segmentation model, and it returns a segmenter. The segmenter is a function from TensorFlow that can receive an image and return segmentation data about the image. And finally, we'll create a video track using the Twilio video library. This video track will use input data from the webcam and can be published over WebRTC to a live video chat room. Twilio provides a method on video track called add processor, which we will use to connect a video processor. I'm going to show you how to build our own custom video processor that takes our video input from the webcam and applies a virtual background to it. Let's take a look at what the video processor class should look like. A video processor, according to the Twilio video documentation, is an object that has a method called process frame that will be run on every frame of video coming from a video track that the processor is attached to. Process frame takes two arguments, input frame buffer and output frame buffer. Input frame buffer is an off-screen canvas that contains a single frame from the source video track and output frame buffer is an HTML canvas element that we will render to in order to create the output image. Because input frame buffer is an off-screen canvas, this implementation of virtual backgrounds will only work in browsers which support off-screen canvas, which at the moment are only Chromium browsers like Google Chrome and Microsoft Edge. When we first built the virtual backgrounds feature for Dialer Video, Twilio Video didn't have support yet for, virtual, uh, for video processors. So we had to hack together a different way of manipulating video track data. Our solution for dialer video does not use off-screen canvas and therefore supports a wider range of browsers. But to keep this demo simple, we're going to use Twilio's built-in video processor feature with these limitations. To make things even easier, Twilio has actually created a few pre-built video processors, including one that does virtual backgrounds. But we're going to build our own for this demo because building your own is more fun. Okay, so our video processor is going to be an instance of a class we'll call virtual background processor. We'll take our video from the video HTML element and our segmenter from the create segmenter function and pass them as initialization options to the new instance of the virtual background processor class. On the virtual background processor instance, we'll store the segmenter as this.segmenter and the virtual background video as this.virtualBackground so that we can reference them both later. 
We'll also initialize a special WebGL canvas called FX Canvas and a WebGL texture called FX Texture. These both come from a library that we'll use called glfx.js, and we're going to use it to perform computationally heavy image manipulation that our bilateral filter uses. Finally, we'll need to implement the process frame method on the instance described by the Twilio video video processor documentation. Once we have instantiated our virtual background processor, we will have a video processor that we can pass back to our Twilio video track using the add processor method. Here's how our virtual background processor video processor class is initialized. We'll provide it with the segmenter that we created that uses TensorFlow with the MediaPipe selfie segmentation model and store it as this.segmenter on the instance. We'll also store our chosen virtual background as this.virtualBackground. And finally, we'll initialize a special WebGL canvas called FX Canvas from the GLFX library. We'll also initialize FX Texture with an empty image. We'll use this to quickly store the segmentation mask for each frame to be filtered with the bilateral filter. With the virtual background processor class initialized, we can implement the process frame method, which will run on every frame of video that the processor is attached to. For process frame, the first thing we'll need to do is get the 2D context from our output frame buffer HTML canvas element so that we can perform compositing operations on the output image. Next, we'll need to segment the input image coming from the input frame buffer off-screen canvas, which we can simply pass to our segmenter segment people method. After the machine learning runtime has processed the image, we'll be able to get the segmented image data as a mask from the resultant object and move on to the compositing steps. And when I refer to image data, I mean the image data type that comes from a canvas element. This is just an array of RGBA pixel data, which we can use to quickly paint an image onto a canvas. And shout out to the MDN documentation. Could not do my job without this, so yeah. For the compositing steps, we'll be making heavy use of Canvas 2D API's global composite operation property. This property sets the type of compositing operation to be performed when drawing new images over existing images in Canvas. We'll first set the output Canvas's global composite operation to copy. This simply takes the new drawing instruction and paints it on a blank Canvas, removing whatever existed in the Canvas beforehand. We're using copy for the first composite step so that our frame starts out fresh without the contents of the previous frame. Then all we have to do is call draw image, passing the mask image data along with the top left coordinates of 0, 0 to instruct the canvas to draw our mask in the output canvas frame. The second step is to apply the bilateral filter. For this, we're using the GLFX library's denoise method. First, we need to load the mask that we painted in the first step into the FX texture. Then we'll call draw on the WebGL FX canvas and use the GLFX denoise method with an exponent of five. This amount will smooth out artifacts left over from the segmentation without blurring the edges of the mask too much. And finally, we'll draw the contents of the FX canvas onto our output canvas. Since we're still in copy mode, this will replace the original mask with the denoised version from the FX canvas. To clean up the mask further, we're going to change our global composite operation to destination in and draw the original mask again. What destination in does is it instructs the canvas to draw existing content only where it would overlap with the new content. This effectively performs a clipping operation, removing some of the blurred edge of our denoised mask, which would result in a halo effect on the final composite. Now that we have a cleaned up mask, we can paint the foreground. We'll switch the global composite operation to source in and draw the original source image over the mask. Source in causes new content to be drawn only where existing content already is, preserving transparency. So our original frame will only be drawn where there is a mask. And finally, with the foreground isolated and rendered, we can paint our virtual background. To do this, we'll switch our global composite operation to destination over. The destination over operation tells Canvas Context to draw new content behind existing content, which is exactly what we want for this last step. Now all we need to do is call draw video with our output frame buffer and the virtual background video, and we're done. We now have a fully composited video frame that will be passed along to the video track for publishing. 
Using other global composite operation types, we can come up with even more creative effects, like this one that uses soft light to create an effect where it looks like I am inside of the twinkle lights from the background. Now, this isn't particularly useful for our desired virtual background effect, but sure is fun to mess with. And ultimately, that's exactly what coding should be, fun. After all, we will be much better and more creative at our jobs as software engineers if we're having fun while we're doing it. So before I go, I want to leave you with a fun thing that Doximity does called Hack Day. This is a clip of me obviously having fun, trying out a feature that I built for Dialer Video called Auto Zoom. It uses machine learning to track my face and keep it centered and zoomed in the frame. Now you might be thinking that I must have way too much free time on my hands to be spending on something silly like this. But actually this was created for my company's hack day. Once a quarter at Doximity we have a day which over the years has evolved to two or three days now where engineers get to work on any project that they feel like. It can be building a tool that helps with a job or a proof of concept like Zoomy here. And it's a great way for engineers to try things out without necessarily worrying about business purpose or product fit, um, which ultimately this auto zoom feature didn't quite have. And uh, that's why it will forever remain an unmerged pull request in the Dialer Video Git repository. But let me show you another Hack Day project that I worked on. Yeah, this is a screenshot from the very first working prototype of the virtual backgrounds feature for Dialer Video. And it was built over the course of just two days for Hack Day. In this version, it was very much a low fidelity proof of concept, but it caught the attention of the product team who thought that it could become a useful addition to the Dialer video product. And so over the course of the next quarter, we turned it from this barely functioning hack day project to a fully working feature with all of the design, performance optimizations, and quality assurance that we normally would devote to our software. I love Hack Day, and I highly encourage you to try it out at your companies if you don't already do something like it. I think it's a big part of what makes coding fun. But also, Doximity is fun. And we're hiring for a variety of roles. <laughs> Shameless, I know, yes. Um, if you would like to work with an amazing group of people on some really interesting problems like this virtual background feature that we saw today, then I encourage you to scan this QR code and check out our open positions. Or if you're not looking for a job, um, this QR code also has links to all the references used throughout this presentation, including a link to the demo and the source code for the demo, um, if you'd like to learn more about machine learning in the browser. So thank you all for your time today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your conference. Thanks.